Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, choir, for leading us in this time of worship. Let me invite you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. And we are going to be looking at verses 18 through 22. And we're going to be looking at this text as we come to it in the passage. So let's go to the Lord together now in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for everything that we've already experienced here in your house today. We thank you, Lord, for your promise where two or three are gathered that you are there also. And, Lord, you are here today. And we've, we've come to worship you, to lift up your name. Father, we pray that you would speak to our hearts through your perfect word. So we ask your blessing upon the reading of it, the preaching of it, and the hearing of it. We ask in the rich name of Jesus. Amen. Tim Bowden tells the following story in his book, One Crowded Hour, about the war between Malaysia and Indonesia in 1964. During that war, a group of Gurkhas from Nepal were asked if they were willing to jump from transport planes to do battle with the Indonesian troops. And since the Gurkhas have, had never been trained to fight as paratroopers, they were given the right to turn down the mission without any dishonor. They were an extremely honorable people, hard-fighting people. They were known for their fierce fighting skills. They were afraid of nothing. They never denied a mission, but they had never served as paratroopers. So they were given the option of turning down the mission. This time, they were a little hesitant. Their commanding general said, no question, we'll accept the mission, but on two conditions. He said, first of all, you got to promise that you'll drop us on soft ground where there's no rocks or large boulders. Second, you got to promise you'll drop us at a slow speed and at an altitude less than 100 feet. The commanding general said, well, the first request, no problem. You'll be dropped in the jungle, in a clearing in the jungle. There are no rocks there. It's naturally soft ground. But the second request is impossible. But our planes can fly as slowly as possible. We may receive ground fire that may cause problems, but we can fly slowly, but we cannot fly less than 100 feet. Your parachutes won't have time to open. The Gherkin general said, parachutes? But if you give us parachutes, we'll jump anywhere, anytime. <laughs> That's the way followers of Christ ought to be. Whatever he calls us to do, we ought to be ready to do. Anywhere, anytime. Because you see, in Christ, and here's the point of the passage, you can't miss this. In Jesus Christ, our, law, our, our lives are not ours. They're His. And when we receive Christ as our Savior and as our Lord, we give Him our lives for Him to do with what He wishes to do with them. It's His life, not ours. Well, the last time we were in Matthew, we saw that Jesus began His public ministry by preaching, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And now, this week, the very next passage, we find that Jesus began to multiply his ministry. He called Simon, Andrew, James, and John to be his first apostles. And Christ is still 
multiplying his ministry. He's still calling us to follow him by faith. So what's involved in that? What's involved in following Jesus? We're going to look at two general callings in our time together this morning. First of all, let's look at casting nets. Casting nets. Look again at, or let's look at verses 18 through 20. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Now pay attention. Remember I shared with you several weeks back now that there is a gap between Matthew chapter 4 verse 11 and Matthew chapter 4 verse 12. A very, very important gap. In that space, unseen in Matthew's gospel, occurs John chapter 1, verse 19, through John chapter 4, verse 42. A whole lot occurs in the ministry of Jesus Christ in that gap between Matthew 4.11 and Matthew 4.12. In John 1, Verses 35 through 39, the Bible tells us about two disciples of John the Baptist, Simon and Andrew, who decided to follow Jesus. Then in John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51, Philip and Nathaniel decided to follow Jesus. Now, interestingly, the Bible doesn't tell us when James and John first met Jesus, but it had to have happened sometime prior to Matthew 4.18. I'm sure they met him before this time. Now it's important to realize that at this point, Peter and Andrew and James and John were followers of Jesus, but they followed Jesus just like they followed John the Baptist. I mean, they kept their day jobs, if you will. They were fishermen when they followed John the Baptist, and they were fishermen when they followed Jesus. The point is, even after meeting Jesus, even after trusting him as the Messiah, the Christ, they returned to their normal work. But now Matthew gives us another perspective. And we're not sure how much time has passed from John chapter 1 to Matthew chapter 4. We're not sure how much time has passed from the time that Peter and Andrew and James and John met Jesus until God's call upon their lives in Matthew chapter 4. But here in, in, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus called them to be fishers of men. He called them to be vocational ministers. Now, interestingly, the term fishers of men, it didn't originate with Jesus. The Romans and the Greeks were using this term for centuries before Jesus used it. They used it to refer to anyone who would adhere to their teaching, their philosophy of life, try to catch someone, and to, to grow them in their, in their particular philosophy of life. But when Jesus used it with these men, he was using a very obvious metaphor. He was calling them to leave their, to leave their occupation of fishing for fish and to begin fishing for souls. Now, the way that I fish, when I fish, which is rare, is with a Zebco 33 rod and a graphite reel. No. A Zebco, Zebco 33 reel and a Zebco rod. Thank you for the nods that straightened me out. But the way they fished was with a fishing net. 
It was a circular fishing net, about 15 feet in diameter. It was bell-shaped, so it would hold a lot of fish. Now, I don't know a lot about fishing. I, I'm not an acclaimed fisherman. But I know that there's two kinds of fishing trips. Now, ladies, you need to know this. Men, I'm sorry. When we say we're going on a fishing trip, we mean two different things. One, one meaning, and this is the meaning most of the time, we're going to get away for a few days. And the other meaning is we're going to catch fish. And if you'd be honest, you know, there's just something peaceful about sitting in a boat or sitting on the bank on the lake at dawn or at sunset watching a bobber just bob in the water. There's just something peaceful about being by the water or on the water. But sometimes, if we'd be honest, we'd rather the fish not bother us. We just enjoy being outside. We just enjoy getting away. But those few times in my life that I've really gone on fishing trips, I found it to be much more work than relaxation. One time when I was a teenager, some friends of mine caught 150 pounds, two friends of mine and myself, three of us, caught 150 pounds of catfish in the Ustanala River just north of Rome, Georgia, over a three-day weekend. And we worked hard. We set out trot lines and bank hooks. We checked them every two hours, day and night. We worked hard. We caught a lot of fish, and we had the mother of all fish fries. We had a great time, but we earned it. You see, when you get down to it, fishing is pretty much like anything else in life. We get out of it what we put into it. And it would seem that the same would go with ministry. But not so. You see, with ministry, it's not all dependent upon how hard we work. It is all dependent on the grace of God. It's not all dependent on how hard we work. It's dependent upon the grace of God. We see this clearly, crystal clearly, in Luke's version of this passage, Luke's account. Luke chapter 5. Turn there in your Bibles if you'd like. We're going to read the first 11 verses. Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. Professional fishermen. These were professional fishermen who knew what it took to catch fish. And they had toiled all night and caught nothing. But when they obeyed Jesus, 
They caught so many fish, their nets were beginning to break, and in fact, their boats were beginning to sink. It was the greatest catch any of them had ever seen. And Jesus called these men to leave their fishing vocation and follow him. Now, in Matthew's gospel, every time we see the word follow, it means discipleship. It means discipleship. So Jesus was calling them to change their vocation. And Luke says they forsook all. All that catch, great catch. All their nets that, as you probably know, were passed down from one generation to another. All those fishing boats, their family, they forsook everything and followed him. You see, Jesus Christ, simply put, is the greatest manager that ever lived. And we see him demonstrating his management skills in this passage. He managed by delegation. He delegated authority and responsibility to those that he called to follow him. Eventually, he chose 12 men, and he trained those 12 men to reach others. And then their disciples reach other disciples, and, and those disciples reach other disciples. And that process continues to this very day. Now, Jesus didn't call everyone to vocational ministry. He only called 12 of them during his earthly ministry. And he doesn't call all of us to vocational ministry either. But when he does call, we better pay attention. Or we're going to be the most miserable person on the face of the earth. I know. I ran for two years. And I was miserable. I was miserable. And I learned. I learned a great lesson that I want to share with you this morning. I learned that it's not important. It doesn't matter what makes sense to me. I was a stutterer who couldn't possibly help God in His work. It doesn't matter what I think. All that matters, all that matters is that I obey. And you obey. That's all that matters. Doesn't matter that the private understand the, the order of battle. Doesn't matter. All that matters is that he obeys his general. All that matters is that we obey. That's all. Well, secondly, let's look at mending nets. Mending nets. Verses 21 and 22. Going on from there. He saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. He called them and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. That's significant. Because as you know from the Gospels, Zebedee's wife, her name was, you may know, Siloam. And Siloam was a very close friend of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Some Bible scholars say Siloam was, was Mary's sister, which would have made James and John Jesus' cousins. Who knows? It's interesting, but we don't know. There's something very interesting in this passage. First of all, first of all, don't you know, don't you know Zebedee was thinking to himself, boy, if I was just 20 years younger, I'd be gone, boys. I'd be following you. <laughs> I'd go with you. But he kept the business going. He stayed back, let his boys go. We see something very interesting in this passage. When Jesus called Peter and Andrew, what were they doing? You remember it's in the text. When Jesus called Peter and Andrew, they were doing something. They were casting their nets. When he called James and John, they were doing something different. They were mending their nets. Peter and Andrew went on to become great evangelists. James and John went on to become great teachers. God doesn't always give us the same gifts. God doesn't always call us to do the same thing. 
God equips us with what we need to accomplish what he calls us to do. And Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. And notice, he took them from where they were and he made them to be what he called them to be. And he shaped them through various experiences of their lives. And they all messed up. We know about Peter's messing up, his denial of knowing Christ. That's famous. Siloam got James and John in trouble. You remember? Siloam says, hey, Jesus, when my boys are with you, let one of them sit on one side and one on the other. Because they're important. They're my boy. That's a mama. <laughs> That's a mama. They all, they all fell short. They felt, James and John fell short to the, to the temptation of pride. Peter fell short to, to fear. They weren't perfect. But in their imperfections, in their mistakes, Jesus shaped them into who they were, would be for him. That verse explains Romans 8.28 so well. It gives meaning to Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. That's what that verse is all about. Sometimes bad things happen to good people, but God always has a plan, always has a purpose. He's always shaping us and chipping away at us to make us into the people he would call us to be. You see, becoming, becoming a faithful follower of Jesus Christ doesn't happen overnight. It's something we become over time. None of these men became faithful followers of Christ overnight, but, but all of them in time became great men of God. Simon became Peter the Rock, who Jesus would build his church upon, who would write two books of the New Testament. Every time we find Andrew in the Gospel of John, you know what he's doing? He's doing the same thing. Bringing someone to Jesus. He's, Andrew was always bringing someone to Jesus. James was the first apostle to be martyred for his faith. John, well, John just wrote five books of the Bible. The Gospel of John, Revelation, and the three epistles of John. You see, the cost of following Jesus is high. It's incredibly high. But the blessings, the blessings are eternally great. You see, it's really simple, folks. Sometimes we make life complicated, more complicated than we should. It's really simple. We only have one life to live. We only have so much time. We can always make another dollar. We can never make another minute. We only have so much time. So we've got to get it right. When God calls us, we've got to answer. And we've got to do what he calls us to do. We've got to be who he calls us to. To be, and whatever he calls us to do, we do it well. We do it with all we have and all we are. Taft and I traveled yesterday to Alabama to attend my aunt's funeral. Aunt Frances passed away last Wednesday. I didn't get the word till. Friday, and we got up early Saturday, and we drove down for the funeral. In the funeral message, things were brought out that I'd really kind of forgotten about. Frances was an awesome fisherwoman. In fact, Frances held the record for the largest striped bass ever caught on Lake Smith near Jasper, Alabama, for years and years and years until it was finally broken. One weekend, one three-day weekend, 
Francis caught 103 keepers, largemouth bass. 103 in a three-day weekend. She knew how to fish. Francis Jemerson. On the other side of my family, that was my dad's sister-in-law. Other side of my family, my grandfather's brother, Uncle Lloyd, we called him. Uncle Lloyd wasn't, he wasn't one for sitting around the table drinking a, a cup of coffee with his friends. I mean, he enjoyed people, but he was a little embarrassed by it. We never, we never understood the medical condition that Uncle Lloyd had. He probably never knew what it was either. But Uncle Lloyd had a shake in his left hand, and he couldn't control it. And his hand shook all the time. And he would take it with his right hand, and then his whole body would shake. He couldn't stop his left hand from shaking. So he did everything with his right hand. He drank with his right hand. He ate with his right hand. He did everything with his right hand. But when we were eating, if he happened to put his left hand on the table, all of our coffee spilled or all of our tea would spill because it would shake the table. It embarrassed Lord, Uncle Lloyd. We didn't care. We just cleaned up after him. We loved him. He was an awesome guy. But Lloyd didn't... He was embarrassed. He didn't think much about drinking coffee and making a mess. I'll tell you one thing. Lloyd Brown was the best bass fisherman I've ever known in my life. He could fish Francis under the table. Bill Dance or Orlando Wilson had nothing on Lloyd Brown when it came to bass fishing. He'd hold that rod in his, his left hand He'd make his cast, and he would hold that rod in his left hand, and he would talk about Alabama football or about whatever, just not paying attention to what he was doing, reeling in his, his, in his line, and he would just catch a fish. And we were just astonished. It was almost, it was almost like the fish were bothering him. Like, oh, wait, wait a minute, i got to take this fish off my, off my line, and, and I'll get back to my story. And we'd try to imitate We were teenagers. We'd try to imitate him. We'd shake our hands. And we couldn't catch fish like Lloyd. He caught them without trying. He was embarrassed drinking. He couldn't drink coffee without spilling it on himself, but he could catch fish. He could work that worm without even trying because of that shake that God gave him in his left hand. When he wouldn't even try, and he'd catch ten times the fish that we'd ever catch. God calls some of us to cast nets. And he calls some of us to mend them. But he calls all of us to follow him. Some of us as full-time vocational ministers. Others as lay ministers. Either way, all Christians are ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he calls all of us to follow. And he calls all of us to serve. You know, Abraham Lincoln, I love reading about Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln had a, had a saying. Whatever you are, be a good one. That's what Lincoln would say. Whatever you do for Christ, do it well. Do it with all excellence. Take that shake. Take that thorn in your flesh. Take everything you have and use it for the glory of God. They forsook all. And followed him. What's our excuse? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your calling. It's not our calling. It's not our idea. It's your calling. Lord, forgive us when we lean too much on our own understanding and trust in you too little. Forgive us when we allow our rationale and our reasoning 
keep us from obeying you, following you. Lord, may we be like the example we find in this passage, like these disciples who would forsake all and follow you. Lord, get our minds off of our hindrances, off of our weaknesses, and set our eyes upon Jesus who has all power over all things. And let us simply be known as obedient people. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You're here today and, and you've never prayed to receive Jesus Christ. This invitation is for you. If you've never given your life to Christ, you're not a disciple of Christ. You're not a follower of Christ. You're not sure that if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven. You've got to make sure. You come today, and you can know for sure. Maybe God's calling you to vocational ministry. Maybe you know it. Maybe you've been fighting it. Or maybe God is calling you to support someone. to give so that missionaries, people that God has called out, clearly called out, can go and do what they called, what God's called them to do. We need to obey. Whatever God is calling us to do, we need to do it. We need to obey. So however he's calling this morning, you come. Don't wait. Don't let your reasoning cloud your obedience. You come. Sharon, come and lead us, please.